Hello, magical people of the internet. I am Jen, and welcome to my show, I Never Thought I Would, where we talk about doing things we never thought we would do and the incredible places that they can lead us. Today, we have a really amazing guest. He is a writer, actor, director, producer, and a very good friend of mine, Levy Lee Simon. In my opinion, he is one of the most prolific playwrights of our generation. And I feel so grateful that he agreed to come on and talk with us today. So welcome to the show, Lee. Hey, how are you, Jen? <laughs> I am well. How about you? How are you? I'm good. I mean, all things considered, you know, I've been very, very um, fortunate and very busy. Um, you know, during these last six months of mostly being quarantined. Uh, you gotta take the COVID thing very seriously. But I've been home and it's almost like God said, hey, you know, um, be still and know that I am God. And I and like, all this stuff has just been falling my way. And it's like, and I've been very busy and very grateful for all of it. And uh, I say, dang, if I knew all I had to do was stay home, I would have done that a long time ago. <laughs> I'm sure you have dozens of things that you've done that you never thought you would do. So why don't you tell us about one of them and how it led you somewhere in your life where you never thought you would end up? That's an easy one for me. Because um, like you said, there have been several what I call cross crossroads in my life. Um, but the major one happened and goes back to 1996. Um, I'm in New York. My manager called me one night and asked me if I would take a ride with him up to the O'Neill Festival to see uh, see a play. And uh, on the ride up, uh, I said, well, I didn't even know whose play was being done. And he said, Lee Blessing. Now, the thing about Lee Blessing, who, the great playwright Lee Blessing, who had plays on Broadway, Into the Woods, and a number of other pieces, and he was supposed to be heading the playwrights workshop, MFA workshop at the University of Iowa. Now, six months prior to that, um, I was coming home from acting in a play at Cincinnati Playhouse in the park. I'd been out of New York City for a few months and I, and I w walked into my apartment on the Lower East Side on 14th Street. I opened my door, the phone is ringing. I picked it up and it was my friend, uh, Barbara Goldman. She goes by Emma now. But Barbara Goldman, who had gone to the University of Iowa the year before, and she said, hey, Lee, they're offering fellowships for minority playwrights, you know, and I, and I gave them your name. And I'm like, I, I'm not interested in going back to grad school. I mean, going to school, I, no, I'm done with that, you know? And she <laughs> said, she said but, but look, look, they're offering a full ride and blah, blah, blah. She laid down her case. And she said, and I gave them your play because she had worked behind the scenes on, on my play, God, the Crack House and the Devil, that circle repertory. And, and I was like, eh, I'm getting ready to go to London, you know, to act in this play. And um, that was in, that was in 95. That was like December of 95. So 96 comes in and we're supposed to be going to London and that didn't work out. And, oh, by the way, she sent that application anyway, you know, and she, so- She sent the application with your name and your info on it? Yeah, and so now I got the application, right, in my, in my apartment. I didn't even open it up. I just threw it, you know, on the, on the table. And then when we weren't going to London for this play, uh, it was another one of those moments or another promise that didn't come through. And I looked at the application and I'm like, eh, I don't know. And I let all that time go by because that was like January and they had a deadline of April or something like that. April came and went. So now I'm in the car on my way up to the O'Neill Festival, it's July. And this Lee Blessing is gonna run the department at Iowa. And so I'm sitting in the theater watching this play, Going to St. Ives, a beautiful, Lee, Lee is a wonderful writer, and um, the great Novella Nelson was in it. At intermission, uh, the guy sitting next to me, who I, who I didn't see, you know, in a the dark theater, but when the lights came up, was the set designer 
for the play that I was in in Cincinnati. And I said, you know, I want, I want to meet Lee Blessing. He said, Lee, I designed this set. Come with me to go outside. And Lee is surrounded by people. And John pushes through and says, Lee, meet Lee. And he said, Lee Simon? And I go, yeah. He says, aren't you supposed to be coming to Iowa? <laughs> I was like, uh, uh, uh. I was having a reading of My God, the Crack House and the Devil play the following week in New York. And I invited him. And he said, well, you know, Lee, I, uh, I got to go back up to LA. I got this to do, that to do. He said, but if I can make it, I, I will make it. And sure enough, that in following Monday, he came to see the reading. And then he called me the next day and he said, hey, look, man, I really liked your play. And I know you might be thinking that coming back to school, you're going to be treated like a, a student. He said, but I think that, you know, you will get a lot out of coming to Iowa and we will get a lot out of you being there. Basically, he said, you know, I'll take care of everything on our end. All you have to do is get there. And I was like, okay, God, I hear you, <laughs> you know? And so now that's July. I have like two weeks to prepare to change my entire life, go to Iowa. I was actually up for a part in a Broadway play um, with Danny Glover and uh, they had me on hold for it was for an understudy but still it was Broadway right and they had me on hold for that and um, I talked to my manager and I talked to a couple my, my sister said um, I told her she said you going to Iowa and I said I, yeah, I'm, I'm thinking of, she said what, what are you going to do in Iowa Lee you know, and you know, and they're gonna send your black ass back in six weeks. I say, I, I don't know, I don't know. About a week before I was to, to leave, I had been talking to Lee every day because he needed like information, you know, to fill out the applications and stuff like that. I called the theater department and the secretary, who I didn't know at the time, who actually became a good friend of mine, uh, Denise, said, uh, Lee, are you sitting down or standing up? And I said, what, what's going on? And she said, Lee Blessing resigned. I said, oh. She said, but the offer will still stand. And she put me on the phone with the head of the theater department, Alan McVeigh. And again, it was one of those moments that, okay, God, I hear you. And I didn't have to think about it. I said, yeah, I'm going. And um, a week later, you know, after a 20 something hour, Greyhound bus ride. I was in Iowa City, and it was like the the most profound move I ever made in my life. And never thought I would be in Iowa City. And never thought, you know. Listen, I'm born and raised in Harlem, USA, and I had done a lot of traveling, you know. By that time in my life, you know, acting around the country and even overseas. But I had never been in a place with so many blonde haired, blue eyed people in my life. And it was like a culture shock. But at the end of the day, it was, um, it was the best, one of the best moves I ever made in my life. Um, I went with the intention of writing three plays. It was a, it was a three year program. So I figured, you know, I, I write a play a year that, that didn't seem like, too much. Mm -hmm. uh, I ended up writing 17 plays. And wow. Because <laughs> I ended up being in Iowa for five years. I Three years in the graduate program and I got my MFA and then two years I taught there. And uh, during that five years I wrote 17 plays. And uh, of those 17, 12 of them have been produced. So, you know, and then from there, I came to LA because one of those plays was picked up by a studio, the Fox Searchlight, my Bow Wow Club play. And that led me to LA. So going to Iowa, you know, literally changed my life. And it wasn't something that I, I planned to do. It wasn't like, you know, this was a dream opportunity for me that I thought about all, because I didn't even know what, you know, the, 
because uh, University of Iowa writing uh, workshops are like they're they're known all over the world. The fiction, poetry, nonfiction. You know, some great writers have come out of there, but I wasn't aware of that. Uh, I got an opportunity to be in that kind of environment, and it was the best thing that could have happened to me and for me. It's amazing how the opportunity found you first with yeah. your friend Barbara slash Emma, and then what are the chances of going to see a theater festival, sitting beside the person who did your set design, who also did the set design for Lee Blessing, then when you're introduced to Lee, Lee knows who you are. You were excited to meet him. He right. was excited to meet you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so serendipitous. And it's amazing how if we listen to God or the universe, whatever anyone wants to call it, we are being guided on our path. Yes. If we don't resist it, it's sure. amazing how opportunities are presented to us. They're not necessarily the ones we want. They're not right. necessarily the ones we think are going to get us um, where we want to be. Right. But it's amazing how when things keep coming up, you just have to surrender to it and say, okay, I guess this is where I'm meant to be right now. It reminds me of one of, one of my favorite quotes or sayings is that we, you know, we make plans and God laughs. Exactly. <laughs> you know. Well, that's such an incredible story. And you ended up spending five years there. So beyond the program, you had the opportunity to teach. Because I taught... Um, playwriting, I taught a, a course called Art of the Theater, which kind of incorporated all the art, all the art forms, you know, directing, writing, acting, all that. And, and I also taught African American drama, which was an exciting course. So then from Iowa, you went directly to Los Angeles or did you go back to New York for a time? I left Iowa and came directly to LA and uh, because Fox Searchlight had picked up Bow Wow Club, there's a lot of uh, excitement around it. And, uh, you know, I came into LA with like a lot of fanfare, uh, a lot of write-ups in different magazines and, and you know, Hollywood Reporter and Showbiz, all of that stuff. And then it didn't work out, <laughs> you know, the, 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 the movie, uh, Forrest Whitaker was slated to direct it, and we had uh, commitments from some very um, A-list, you know, black actors. And and for whatever reason, no fault of my own, it didn't it didn't happen. But at the end of the day, um, uh, the one of the producers at Fox Searchlight, when we were about to go into pre-production, uh, she got into a car accident. And um, she almost died, she's fine now, and she's still in the business. But that threw everything off. So all the people that were attached to the movie, they ended up going and doing different things. Forrest went, Whitaker went off and you know started working on other projects. But she was in the uh, hospital for quite a while. She almost died. And then the project was shelved. They tried to, to do, ha make it happen, but it, it, it just, everything got derailed. Yeah. And um, so we never got got it back. But the good part is that the, a lot of times what happens is a script will go into what they call turnaround. And once it gets there, it's like, it's, it's like in Hollywood purgatory, you know, it just never, that play will never be done because the a production company or the studio owns the script but i did not sell the rights to the script I, I i i optioned it and so i still have the rights to it That's and amazing. so um every couple of years or so you know i'll get a call or i'll get a lead where someone else might be interested in in doing that movie so it's still and it's you know like a lot of my work you know because they're socially relevant it's still viable you know, sometimes they become even more viable as as time goes by. We did the play a couple of years ago, the Bow Wow Cup play in Atlanta um, in 2018. It was amazing how relevant that play still is. It still is because of the subject matters that it covers 
you know, is still happening in the world today, you know, whether it be, you know, the police and what's going on with the police in, in the black community, uh, whether it be, um, you know, uh, interracial relationships. Some, some people ask me if I would, would update it. And I'm like, no, I, I, wanna, I wanna keep it within its time period. It's a period piece now, you know? Yeah. And, and so we look at it from perspective of time and space. And it's, I think it even resonates more. You know, Speaking of your plays, didn't you have one of your more recent plays published? The Magnificent Dunbar Hotel, which was a play that I was commissioned to write of the Roby Theater Company, which was founded by Ben Guillory and Danny Glover here in LA. And I have a long history with that company and they commissioned me to write this play about the Dunbar Hotel, which was the hotel on Central Avenue in LA back in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s that housed, you know, most of the great uh, Black artists that were coming to LA for whatever reason, whether they were coming to perform or whether they were coming for some political reason because the NAACP would be there, you know, and it was a place that the black community, all aspects of the black community, you know, the athletes and the, and the celebrities and the politicians and, you know, even even church people, and everyone would, would, would convene at the Dunbar, you know, and the Dunbar was a happening spot. It also led to other clubs opening on Central Avenue and it became like the, the Renaissance, you know, of the West, you know, like the Harlem Renaissance was on the East Coast, mm -hmm. you know, Central Avenue and the Dunbar Hotel was the uh, Renaissance on the West Coast. And it's very exciting. I mean, I, I, I had so much fun uh, doing the research for it and discovering all these amazing characters and stories, you know, you know, Charlotte Bass, who was uh, the editor of the Eagle newspaper, was this dynamic Black woman who nobody really knows about and she was a dynamo and uh so she is prominent in the play the play was done at the roby theater in 2014. we had 29 straight sold out performances we had amazing reviews across the board which was like first time that some reviewer didn't find a reason to slam me <laughs> and then we were invited to the Na national black theater festival following year 2015. the play is now a published piece and uh, on amazon the magnificent dunbar hotel if anybody wants to wants to buy it i'm going to include the links below so anyone who's watching um there'll be a link below to the amazon yeah. page for the play and yeah. then don't you have a performance coming up as well Ooh, yeah, man. <laughs> uh, the Wi-Fi Theater in, in L.A., here in L.A., um, on Ventura in the Valley, uh, w uh, well known for um, producing one-person show. I got a call from Juliet Jeffers, who works with the White Fire. She's also a, a solo performer, and, uh, she, and I know her, and she asked me if I would be willing to uh, present a one person show. And how did she know that I was kind of thinking about it? And, and then again, just like you say, sometimes the universe just puts something right before you and it's like, oh God, okay. Cause I wasn't really thinking about it. Like I'm going to do it. It was just a thought. And then here it was, here's the opportunity. Are you ready to just take this opportunity or not? And I said, of course. And so, well, you know, I have a memoir that I'm writing and, and I thought I would take excerpts from the memoir and create this one solo show. But because of what we're going through, you know, in the country right now with, you know, all the issues that are centered around race and the police and, and all that, I figured I'd tailor the, the night's performance to deal with that stories from my life, mm -hmm. my, my, my personal life that deal with issues of, of race and racism. So that's what I'm doing. That's what I'm working on. I'm, I'm, 
it'll be it'll be stories, monologues, poetry, and I'm 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 excited about it. A little nervous about it because um, I've never done anything like this before, um, and I know how you know daunting to be on stage, you know, by yourself. You know, because yeah. I don't even have an audience, you know, like not in front of me. I mean, you guys out there in, in Cyberland will be my audience, but I won't be able to reach out and touch, reach out and touch, you know, <laughs> I won't be able to reach out and touch somebody's hand, you know. Um, to, to perform without having audience reactions. It, so well, it, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a challenge as well, especially when you're doing a one person show, because those are the those are the partners you have to feed off of because exactly. nobody's on the stage with you. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And I'm, 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 you know, uh, of course, you know, uh, nervous, but at the same time, I'm, I'm feeling it's an opportunity to share my gifts, you know, as a writer and as a performer, I started out in the business as an actor and there are people that know me from that life. And then I became a writer, and there are people that just associate me with being a writer. But I love to, I love acting. I, you know, I always say acting is my love and writing is my responsibility. You know, now getting an opportunity where I'm actually performing in my own work and being able to share that, you know, with the general wider audience, um, you know, I'm, I'm really happy about the opportunity. What is the date of your performance? We'll also have the links for the performance information below, but what, what's the date? November 15th, and that will be a six o'clock performance on the, on the West Coast and nine o'clock on the East Coast. And then once this performance is done, what's next? I kind of mentioned that, you know, I've been working on a memoir and, um, that has, you know, uh, been a long, arduous process. It's taken up a lot of time, which has been good because I, I never felt rushed to do it, but I finally finished the first, it'll be in two volumes. And I finally finished the first volume. I'm actually finished both, but the first volume, I'm hoping that will be out at the latest by the end of the year, but I'm hoping that we will have it ready by by november 15th you know um when when i do the solo show that's yeah. so exciting yeah odyssey towards the light that is the name of it wow incredible well thank you so much lee this has been such a treat to thank have you so much jen <laughs> and thank you everyone in cyberland for tuning in we will have the links below for Lee's performance and for his play, The Magnificent Dunbar Hotel. And we will update the link with his memoir when that is available. Don't forget to like and subscribe. And I want to challenge you to do something that you never thought you would do. Let us know what it is. Or if you've already done it, let us know where it led you in the comments. Thanks and have a beautiful day. All right. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs>